one of the uh, challenges of having a conversation about Kim's book is she has avoided the trap that many economists fall into, which is to write extensively about one silo and act as if uh, everything else that happens in the world is irrelevant. So the book ranges widely from trade and trade agreements and, yes, please, globalization and uh, um, uh, uh, immigration to tax policy, labor policy, uh, and how the pieces all fit together. And I think uh, I really appreciate uh, how lucid your presentation was. I think uh, I often think that having speakers here who spend their time talking to undergraduates is a very constructive thing. Uh, that, that wasn't meant to be a joke. That was serious. <laughs> I mean, I know that the average level of the average undergraduate at Reed College is probably somewhat higher than the average member of Congress, but we can all strive in that direction. Um, so uh, I thought what would be useful is if we started by talking about the issues on trade and globalization. And to that end, um, we have a, a particularly interesting bunch of people here. Um, at the end is Laurie Wallach, who ha uh, knows more about trade and trade agreements than anybody else in Washington. She's been thinking about them for 25 years, and if you want to know what's on page six of the uh, Korea-US trade agreement, she can tell you what's there, how it got there, and what they should have done better. Lori is the director of Public Citizens Global Trade Watch. Uh, next to her is Samaya Keynes, who is an uh, economics and trade editor at The Economist and the uh, host of the, what is it called, Trade Talks? Trade Talks podcast, which she does with Chad Bone from our across the street at the Peterson Institute, which is uh, really a wonderful uh, way to learn about this stuff while you're exercising. It's a painless way to make the time fade. I speak from experience. Uh, and Kim Elliott is now a visiting fellow at the Center for Global Development. She's been involved in writing about trade and trade agreements and around the world for many years. So we have a good, very different perspectives. Um, Laurie, I wonder if I could start with you. Um, so Kim basically makes the case uh, that there's lots wrong in the American economy. Uh, a lot of workers are getting screwed. A lot of companies are taking advantage of them. But globalization and immigration are not the cause, so we shouldn't try and limit them because that would be counterproductive. And since you've been involved in the trade debate since the early 90s, uh, about the time I came to Washington originally, I wonder when you, if you look across the arc of the debate of policy over, and, and political debates over trade, whether you think, how, this, how does this fit into that? Is this uh, a good restatement of old views or is there something new and interesting here? And remember to push the button in the middle that looks like some Wi-Fi signal coming out of someone's there mouth. There we go. Um, well, the first thing I want to say is I think that the book has some very useful, interesting things to say about U.S. tax policy and international tax policy vis-a-vis -vis profit shifting and tax avoidance. There's some important points, I think, about antitrust and concentration of corporate power in, in, in multinationals. And so I think those are all a variety of ideas that I think there isn't enough focus on in Congress, and I hope a future U.S. president thinks about. With respect to the trade issues, um, I think both the rhetorical frame actually is an example of the kind of framing and argumentation that to some degree got us Trump. Um, it is a restatement of the same arguments that have been kicked around in defense of the status quo. And in fact, I think when I teach, I teach a seminar sometimes on trade politics, um, I might assign parts of that book because it actually has every single trope that you have ever heard in Washington recycled, which a bunch of them are sort of debunked on causation or other issues, or there's just now new academic research that disproves, for instance, the automation issue. Um, I would send people to the literature review part of uh, the most recent paper by, I think it's Susan Helper, that goes through all of the literature that basically at this point disproves actually whether in the dichotomy between trade and automation, which is had the biggest impact on job loss and income inequality. But be that, be that as it may, I think the bigger issue and the reason why it's the, the proposals um, 
in a way, on policy are some of the right ones on trade, but the argumentation <laughs> is probably closes down some of the people you'd want to hear those arguments, is because it's premised on a false equivalence, the arguments about trade, putting Trump and Sanders critiques of the current trade regime in the same boat, and they're not. Trump has a very nationalist, isolationist frame of the foreigners are out to get us, um, which is empirically kind of boneheaded given the US negotiators framed and led a lot of the negotiations that Trump is now attacking is against the United States, which is a kind of complicated <clears throat> contradiction in reality. However, Sanders' critique, which is, I would say, my critique, is that we've had capture, which we have in the US 500 official corporate trade advisors in a process that's otherwise closed with limited input by other interests and other communities who've had the opportunity to write a particular set of rules. And as a result, you have rules that have a certain set of interests being benefited versus workers in the environment internationally with different kinds of impacts in different places. But the, the lack of recognition between what is a nationalist sort of isolationist critique that gets into sort of answers are pure protectionism versus a progressive critique, which is their benefits in trade. Let's get the rules right, because this set of rules is not the set of rules that's going to float all the boats. <laughs> and if you have more losers and winners, you can't just basically transfer from the winners to those few losers to try and help ease their transition. You have to get the rules right. And that also goes to a false dichotomy, I think, in how the frame of the idea of open is put together which is, and this is actually a quote from the book, this is, and this theme is over and over and over, but this I thought was the most fleshed out version of it. We can keep economies open, foster international economic relationships and accept immigrants, or we can erect walls, block trade, and erect other barriers to investment. Those aren't the choices. Those aren't the choices. I mean, I think even the most Trumpy of the Trumpians is not talking for art autarky. <laughs> the, the question, I think, is the policy choice that really faces us. And I think having done endless focus groups now of Obama, Obama, Trump voters in Wisconsin, Minnesota, uh, sorry, Wisconsin, Michigan, Ohio, and Pennsylvania to try and figure out what the hell happened. The frame of open is an elite construct that if you posit it as you can either have the status quo, which to, for them, you know, some of the things in the book about economists haven't educated people properly or they get this, or it could be worse is one of the claims. These are the kind of things that make the people who should be voting for Democrats on economic issues think Trump is a better idea. If we posit the choice in front of us is continuing what is, you know, in wonk world we would call the neoliberal status quo, versus a bunch of crazy nationalist, isolationist ideas, the isolation of nationalist sounds just like change. And people don't want more of the same. And inside policy circles, we may say, oh my God, there are enormous downsides to, you know, in many different ways, economically and otherwise, to what he's proposing. But how it, how it is heard to people, because I've watched these focus groups and it's really interesting, how it's heard is, that guy's for change, that lady is for the status quo. I'm not saying it's a fair characterization, but when we're trying to figure out how the hell people who voted twice for Obama then voted for Trump, which is part of my job, is to figure out how to educate the public that it's not neoliberalism versus nationalism. There is a way to get the rules right where you get the benefits of trade without basically the status quo set of rules. And that's just my third point on what's new and what isn't, which is some of, some of Kim's ideas about, and, and sadnesses about what's missing in trade agreements. Where is the environmental cooperation? Where's the tax avoidance? Where is something to deal with corporate concentration, et cetera? I think there's some degree is the difference between recovering trade attorney, who does not know economics very well, unless I'm taught by others, and economists, which is looking at the policies. That I think there's a basic misunderstanding of what's in the agreements. That's part of the premise of the book. So some of the things, first of all, there's a power analysis that's missing. 500 corporate advisors, not a shocker that you have the pharmaceutical companies getting IP protections. 
what is that doing in a free trade agreement? You point that out, but to spell it out, why would we put the classic rent-seeking protectionist device, a government-issued monopoly license to a particular interest, <laughs> into a free trade agreement? <coughs> Obviously, there are reasons to have patents, so people have a way to invest in innovation. Why you would put that in a free trade agreement, this is the kind of thing that like David Ricardo and Adam Smith rolling in graves because it's stopping competition. Or why would you have a set of deregulation for the financial services sector, which you call for financial stability, exactly right goal, important part of the future of a stable global economy, except you know, the World Trade Organization's general agreement in trade and services actually explicitly limits the ways that countries can use non-discriminatory financial regulations. Or that agreement also basically is the anti-antitrust, which is to say it has specific rules. You can't limit by size, you can't limit, you can't break up service providers according to what kind of services they provide, they're conglomerated. So we have a set of existing rules, some of which, for instance, you're calling for expanding, we should do more WTO negotiations. Or, for instance, calling for TTIP as a way to stop competitive deregulation, competition to have low regulatory investment climates, when in fact, all of those agreements have a ceiling on regulation and no floor. So you wouldn't want TTIP or TPP because it's the opposite of what you call for, which is the right goal, which is a floor for global competition. We have global corporations and no global rules right now, but for those that limit what governments can do to try and tame capitalism. So I think a lot of the policy suggestions are right, but there is a confusion about what's in the agreements. And a couple of books I would just say are companion readers. Yeah. Um, Kuttner's new book, Can Democracy Survive Global Capitalism, which deals with a lot of the same issues, but deals about the lack of regulatory policy space. Danny Roderick's last book, and the sort of notion of hyper-globalization, eating policy space needed to have equitable globalization, the very instruments that um, open lauds are the very instruments he says need to basically be renegotiated, some of them scrapped. And then finally, I would sort of flag some of the work that Jared Bernstein has done, laying out the kinds of rules you would want in the global economy so that the winners and losers who've been picked under this current power dynamic and negotiating regime, because it's, it's clearly winners and losers, there are no tariffs to cut, largely speaking. Like the kind of gains you'd normally measure for liberalization, it was done 15 years after the WTO. Now it's about policy choices and who the winners and losers are, the IP, pharma guys, Wall Street, or can we get new rules that distribute gains of globalization and frankly regulate multinational corporations? So. And if I hear you, hear you uh, first of all, I want to thank you for the uh, term uh, empirically boneheaded, which I intend to use liberally. Uh, uh, unfortunately, there are lots of things that are said in Washington or proposed for which that applies, but I haven't heard those two words together. So I, think, I just want to make sure I understand. So you're sympathetic to, I understand you're saying that you're sympathetic to Kim's concern about what's happening to the American worker, and you're sympathetic to her, her concern that her argument that globalization and trade are not to be feared and shut down. So you like the ends that she proposes, but you're suggesting that framing it this way rather than the way you prefer, which is let's have globalization and trade but have better rules, would be more uh, appealing as a political measure. Is that, is that, am I characterizing you right? Part of it. I mean, I, I think Turn on the mic. Part of it. I think that the defense of the status quo has proved incredibly treacherous because people's lived experience right. is so powerful now of what, and they know even- right, But that is, is that a framing? Hold on. Yeah, okay. But then, and they know parts of the policies that have led to the outcomes. So the, it, there is also just, I think, there's a framing issue and there's a policy issue. And on both grounds, the goals you want to get to which is global financial stability, having agreements that deal with multilateral trans-border issues like climate crisis and tax avoidance. Those goals we share. But what instruments and policies will achieve that, and also what things you have to change in the status quo that now prohibit you from dealing with those things, some of the existing <clears throat> trade, but they're not about trade, agreements, 
is a is, is a huge difference. Okay, um, Kim, maybe I can turn to you next because Lori endorses something that Kim argues for in the book that basically trade agreements are a great way to deal with issues of international uh, Im import that go beyond just do we allow six soybeans into the country tariff free or seven. Um, I guess I should say seven billion. Um, and I know that you have some views about whether this is a good use of trade agreements. And I wonder if you could talk about the pros and cons of that. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think Sorry. Confusing having two kids Kim on Elliott. the same yeah. panel. Doesn't happen very often. <laughs> Um, thanks, David, and, and, and thanks to Kim for the book. I really enjoyed reading it, and I, um, I, I in general, do agree with Kim's... I, well, the framing of maintaining openness while also dealing with inequality issues, I mean, I think um, I, I would be sympathetic to. I mean, I th and I think... But I also agree with Lori that... Well, I agree with her that the trade agreements we have, I think, are part of the problem not part of the solution, but I disagree on where I think the trade agreements um, ought to go. Um, you know, I, I, I think that the, what I really liked about the book was focusing on what we need to do to fix the problems of workers and the middle class and inequality are primarily domestic. It is, you know, strengthening the safety net, empowering workers, improving American competitiveness, competitiveness, and, and fixing, you know, tax policy so that we can pay for all this in a su sustainable way. Um, I also agree with many of her specific recommendations, but I, she sort of, it doesn't spend a lot of time on it, but does sort of say, and let trade agreements do more to fix these problems of tax competition and regulatory competition, and that's where I differ with, with both Kim and Lori, is I think p part of the problem of the backlash against globalization, I, I agree with Lori on that, that it is that trade agreements and trade agreements have gone too far. I, you know, I very much enjoyed reading. I just got through with Danny's book not long ago as well, his new book on st straight talk on trade, is that it? Um, uh, which is similar. It's that there, we've tried to do too much with trade agreements. Um, and you know, because they have steadily expanded. Um, they have added, you know, competition chapters. I mean, and the thing is, you know, I, where I disagree with Lori on labor and the environment is th those things have also strengthened steadily over the years. If you look at, I know that the main left argument against the labor and environment chapters is they're not enforced. That's sort of a different problem, and I don't really think we can do it very well through trade agreements. I think we need to look at um, other areas. So sort of this is not going to fly politically at all, but I would be inclined to remove a bunch of chapters from the U.S. trade agreement template. IP, I think we probably maybe all agree that it has gone too far in terms of protecting intellectual property. It's bad for developing countries as well that the drug patents are not appropriate, the copyrights are not appropriate for poor countries with little innovative activity to protect, so I'm also concerned about that side of it, um, to the degree that people are concerned about trade agreements impinging on American uh, national sovereignty and policy autonomy. Well, imagine if you're a negotiator from, you know, Costa Rica, right? You got no chance <laughs> to preserve any policy autonomy. You're going to sort of take what's put in front of you. So I, so I, I completely agree um, with. The, that there are problems with the current trade agreement template that I think we need to fix, but it's more paring back than adding, piling more and more on and thinking that that's going to work um, very well. I, coming back just for a second to the, to the um, sort of the broader agenda of what I think is really needed to help the middle class and workers is this broader domestic agenda. And there it is, the politics. And I guess that was my sort of biggest disappointment with the book is that I, I didn't find answers there. You know, there, I, I agree with the, the, the recommendations about we need redistricting reform, we need campaign finance reform, and we need these things. The question is, how do we get there? And, and this has been, Lori, I've been working on the trade stuff as long as Lori has. Um, you know, and, and a lot of us have been saying for decades, we need to take care of the losers. We need to make sure that they're made whole. We need to support workers. We need stronger unions. We need better education. We, we've been saying it for decades and decades. And, you know, and that, I would argue domestic policy in a lot of areas has gotten worse, not better. So as I was reading the book, I kept Harking back, I don't, I don't think E.J. Dion is here today, but he wrote a column in, the, in 19, November 1997, 
that I kept thinking about. It was he wrote it after Congress at the time had rejected President Clinton's request for fast track authority to facil facilitate negotiating some new trade agreements. And he interviewed Barney Frank, because a lot of Democrats, even with a Democratic president, a lot of Democrats in, in Congress voted against giving Clinton fast track authority. And Barney Frank said, you know, quote, we're going to hold globalization hostage to equity. We're basically not going to approve more trade agreements until we get progress on these domestic priorities. Well, that was 1997. We had two agreement, trade agreements at the time. We have 14 now. So I still don't know how we move forward on the domestic agenda, but I do think that that's, on the one hand, where our focus needs to be, and on the other hand, maybe just not worrying about trade agreements so much. Um, we're not really negotiating good ones right now. Um, anyway, maybe just focus on that domestic agenda and, and then try to build the support to keep openness in the meantime. Thanks. Thank you, Kim. In my experience, if you want good political strategy, economists are not the right place to go. So maybe it's just as well that you didn't lay that out <laughs> <laughs> in the book. Uh, Samaya, so there's an interesting theme here. I think it's that uh, we all understand in this room and among uh, a lot of elites that globalization and trade and immigration are basically good for America and good for Americans. We just haven't found a way to explain that to them and we haven't found a way, as Laurie points out, to set up rules of the road that make sure that the benefits are widely distributed. And we haven't done those things which have nothing to do with trade to raise the living standards and the prospects for future living standards for a lot of workers. So we have this big clash now, uh, a revolt of the people who feel left out. Their target is globalization and trade. And uh, the, the, I would say the forces of defense are regrouping. And I'm sort of, uh, uh, I'll put a question mark at the end of that and you can say whatever you want. <laughs> Great, excellent. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, okay, so, so um, there's a bit, so okay, so first of all, I just want, you know, thanks, thanks for this. Um, I, I read the book, greatly enjoyed it. Um, I, and I think, in some senses, it, it, it set an example for um, the way I wish more debates were conducted in, in Washington. Um, I, wrote, I wrote down a sentence that I really like from the book. Um, uh, well, my favorite sentence, and it's more the phrasing than the content, although I'm, I'm happy with the content, which is, going without trade, which is autarky, um, going without trade is quite harmful to a country's well-being. Um, and... and, and Yes, <laughs> um, I, and so there's a there's a you know, I think there's a there's a way in which that clash that David just described has been um, litigated and fought over in the public debate. Um, you also wrote in the book that you know meaningful inclusive debate on the substance of these of, of TPP was virtually absent, and part of me the kind of conflict hating writer for the Economist. Um, I, it wishes that more kind of debates could could happen in in a way that um, is that expresses the uncertainty that that we have um, in a, in a clearer way. So um, there's a bit of a contrast, I suppose, because obviously the talk you gave was the most false. You know, you were trying to present you know the, your conclusions in a forceful way. But if you read the book, there's actually a lot of nuance and and, and uncertainty about some things, right? So you come down on the on the side that it's you know it's actually mostly technology and not trade but i think one of the really interesting um uh you know ways of getting to that is actually to say you know in some senses there isn't it's difficult to disentangle those two philosophically right so you might observe something as technological process in progress in the in the data but you don't know what what's you know, spurred that. It could be that the pressure of outside trade competition was the thing that meant that um, the technology, the, the displacement happened because of technology at a faster rate, right? And so um, it, it's kind of nuances like that that I, I wish were heard more loudly as we, you know, go to war over whether it's technology or trade, right? Um, I, 
Also, I don't think Kim knows this, but you actually cite an article that I wrote in The Economist. We don't have bylines, so you wouldn't, you wouldn't know this, but there was a kind of yelp of wonder when, when, I, when I read the footnotes. So, so, you know, more of that. That, that, sounds, that sounds great. Um, okay, but then you have to promise to write in The Economist in simple declarative sentences following yeah. Kim's model. Sure. <laughs> sure. I'll get back to you on that. Um, okay, so, so um, I wanted to... So, you know, with all of that, this, this, this fighting in the background, um, I think that I also wish that there was more discussion of the actual substantive things in the rules, right? So in, in a sense, I, you know, I agree with you, and I want to have this debate over what's actually in the rules, right? And, and so, you know, over the next six months, we're going to have these two massive debates, right? One is going to be over USMCA, the rewritten NAFTA, and one of them is going to be over US-China. Um, and, you know, there are, there are tensions, I think, in applying this dichotomy of open to these debates, right? So, so let's take the USMCA or, or NAFTA. So essentially, the, the debate, the real policy debate that is going to happen is over something called state-to-state uh, -state dispute settlement. Um, so one of the problems that the Democrats have identified with the UMC, USMCA as it is written is that essentially there are some procedural problems in the chapter that allows a state to sue another, allows the US to sue the Mexican government if they think that labor standards have been violated, right? Um, in past agreements, essentially what happened was the, the government being sued used these procedural, you know, loopholes to slow down um, the case, which meant that, you know, it, it just took so long, this process was ineffective at actually enforcing the rules had, that had been written into this agreement. The USMCA, as it is written or negotiated, does not, in, does not fix some of those loopholes, right, in the way that actually they were in TPP. Um, and it looks like this was, this was a deliberate thing uh, because the USTR uh, does not like the idea of a different government being able to sue the US, right? It doesn't like this tough enforcement um, provision within the USMCA because there are all these issues of sovereignty, right? Uh, and so... You know, so one these like little procedural loopholes. You know, and you know, and and you won't hear about these loopholes in any speeches by Elizabeth Warren or anything, right? It'll be about you know high level enforcement of the rules, and so it's very difficult to get a handle on what actually that it means, um, what what actually that means. Um, but it's super important, and I think that you know, and it's worth asking the question why why hasn't that problem already been fixed? So so one there's this issue that. Um, uh, you know, we care about sovereignty, right? We care about um, labor standards, right? We don't want, um, uh, lab you know, workers to be um, impressed, not allowed to unionize, that, that sort of thing, right? The, the issue when you write that into a trade deal um, is that you're effectively giving the U.S. government the power of enforcing that over the Mexicans, right? And so there's this issue of, like, well, who's who should be the one enforcing those rules? Shouldn't that be a Mexican issue, right? And so... There's a, there's a kind of tension that the more, um, the, the stronger your language on these labor standards, which is one of the things that people on the left call to, right, the bigger this tension is between like, okay, well, if you write this into a trade rule, then it becomes the job of some other government to enforce that, right? And, th and that kind of seems, the political economy of that seems, seems um, difficult, if anything, right? Why should the American government be the one to, um, to be interfering with the labor laws of Mexico, right? Um, and so, you know, you can have your view on where you should lie, but it, it, it's, it's tricky. Um, and, and that's, I think, one of the reasons, you know, the, the U.S. government isn't going to allow itself to be um, the Mexican government to sort of be able to sue it over um, its unionization um, law, for example, right? And, and so looking at why these things weren't done in the past, I think, explains why um, it's tricky now. Um, I want to say something on, um, uh, again, more on enforcement. Um, I've been spending far too much time with trade lawyers, um, and so all I can think about is um, trade disputes. Um, sorry. <laughs> uh, but so I think one of the things that came up with the US-China dispute is that these tariffs were, were unleashed, right? And you had this this chorus of voices saying this is the you know this is a catastrophe this is the worst thing ever um, tariffs won't fulfill your objectives right 
Um, and then the argument was basically like, oh, you know, you care about the trade deficit, the tariffs won't help, why are you so stupid? Um, and, you know, I happen to agree that trying to affect the bilateral trade deficit with tariffs is not the greatest idea. Um, but there's a, there's a problem, which is that there's a reason why trade deals have expanded over time, which is that they have teeth. Right? So trade deals are these immensely powerful instruments because you can write into a trade deal these rules and then you have an enforcement mechanism. Right? At the World Trade Organization, if someone doesn't stick to the rules, then you know, the threat is that you, you are allowed to apply tariffs on them. Right? And so the, the, these things are powerful only if you think it's credible that at some point you can apply these tariffs as a way of punishing a rule breaker. Right? The idea, obviously, hope, the hope is that no one breaks the rules because they're these mutually beneficial things. But if you, you can't think that trade deals work if you don't think that tariffs can be applied in any circumstance, right? We can, we can agree that perhaps these, these tariffs, these um, punishment devices um, actually uh, hurt you. They're actually, they also are an act of self-harm as well as holding the other party to account. Um, but there's but but there is a kind of problem there right if you if you think that tariffs should never be applied in any circumstances but you say oh but the way our trading system works is that they're useful as this punishment device um, and so so yes that's a kind of uh, difficulty or or um, a nuance that that I suppose um, uh, you know Trump made it difficult for that nuance to come out because there's all this talk about the trade deficits and it looked like there are all these other silly arguments in favor of tariffs. But, you know, supposing the US-China dispute had happened the right way and, you know, someone had taken a case and sued China at the World Trade Organization and they'd found, yes, they were breaking the spirit, they were breaking the letter of the rules, then you'd end up with tariffs at the end of that uh, if China didn't change, change its policies, right? And so, you know, then the argument becomes about, well, you know, the way in which you apply the tariffs, which is a slightly different uh, set of issues. I think I've been talking for long enough. <laughs> I'm trying to get my head around the idea that you're complaining that Trump doesn't show enough nuance. <laughs> I mean, tweets, tweets aren't very long, so maybe that's the problem. <laughs> maybe that's the problem. Uh, Kim, I don't want you to respond to everything, so I, I, yeah. I'm interested in your response to two things, and we can get to... Well, I'll give you a chance before it's over. One is... Um, there's Laurie's argument that your, um, your framing and your focus on openness is good and your lack of attention to how the rules are basically a way for um, capitalists to get an unfair advantage weaken your case for openness. That's one. And the second is Kim's a somewhat uh, more narrower point that making F free trade agreements more expansive is not a good idea. Yeah, I'm happy to talk about both of that. I mean, I think in a way, Lori and I agree about many aspects of the content of trade agreements. If I was going to design a perfect trade agreement, it wouldn't have uh, such tough intellectual property uh, features. It wouldn't have the investor state dispute settlement, settlement mechanism. Um, you know, I think a lot of those are examples of that power dynamic that you point out where corporate interests have been prioritized over worker interests in those agreements. Um, and so I, I imagine an evolution of those agreements that would be healthier, that would downplay those things and, and perhaps include other things. And I, and I don't know that those other things need to be in trade agreements as, as much as in agreements in general, like the um, OECD G20 process on, on addressing tax avoidance, I think was a very useful first step for countries to start to think about ways we could expand agreements. And, and I guess my point about expanding them was in part that if we um, think about carrots that bring the business community to the table to sort of address global issues, one carrot is market access and international trade. And that's a powerful carrot that might get them to be more interested and more collaborative uh, ways of framing our global problems like climate change and tax avoidance. And so I, I view that as a, as a possibility. I mean, another possibility is to just have a standalone trade agreement, I mean, sorry, a standalone agreement on something like climate change that came with border adjustments or a standalone agreement on international tax competition. I think the problem with taking these piecemeal approaches as opposed to something more um, all-encompassing is that, 
you don't you don't have the carrots to balance you know like if you're saying to companies oh let's all cooperate so that we can pay more taxes <laughs> you know like I mean, that's not going to be as exciting to them as if you could pair it with something else um, but I would take issue with one um, element of sort of this focus on trade agreements in general and I do think that um, trade is responsible for some disruption and some cost to American workers but I think it's very um, important to recognize that when we hold up these trade agreements as being so important, like in the Sanders primary ads where he would have the word NAFTA and then he would have a burnt out city and then the word NAFTA and then a burnt out city. Or when we have Trump who's sort of saying like NAFTA was the worst deal we ever made. I think we're actually putting way too much importance on these trade agreements. I don't think the trade agreements really have anything to do with those pictures that I showed you at the beginning that show the, the, the divergence between median income and uh, GDP per capita or the increasing income inequality. It's possible trade has something to do with that. But the trade agreements, <laughs> I think we're putting way too much emphasis. Even if we got the perfect agreement, even if we let Lori and, and a team of experts make the perfect agreement, that's not going to change uh, the, this last generation of income inequality or wage stagnation. And I think we're misleading workers if we're saying, like, listen, if we get the rules right, suddenly everything's going to be perfect for you. And so part of the argument I'm trying to make in the book is that maybe those trade agreements aren't such a powerful lever uh, at helping workers. And instead, if we do focus on the fundamentals, focus on better tax policy, focus on a better partnership with the business community, these big building blocks go directly to the problems. Whereas we could do our dream trade agreements, <laughs> and I don't think we're going to make a very big dent in anything that's really happening to American uh, workers. So... Um, yeah, yeah. Laurie, let me ask you a political question, if I might. So um, uh, I think the, the notion that it's, it, I think there's widespread agreement, not only on this panel, that we have had policies that are inadequate to deal with all the forces that have widened inequality and have to, um, uh, uh, contributed to stagnant wages and incomes among a lot of people. So that's... Um, and I think the arguments made, you can argue whether, Kim was arguing that didn't have a lot to do with trade agreements, but whether it does or not, why, why haven't, the advantage of trade agreements that do benefit big business is that they are, uh, you can, as Bernie Frank suggested, use them as a lever to get other policies which might not have anything to do with trade that would make life better for American workers. So we've heard there have been conversations about things like wage insurance, which would help people who lose their jobs no matter why they lost their jobs and have trouble getting another one. Uh, we had every political candidate talk about increasing the earned income tax credit for single workers. There's all sorts of things that have been, you know, everybody's in favor of doing something good for community colleges, which everybody seems to land on sooner or later when they're trying to figure out. Why hasn't the um, political system been able to deliver these kind of pro-worker, pro-quality benefits as the um, price of getting trade agreements through? And instead, we've ended up with, we'll put a little bit more money into trade adjustment assistance, and we'll write some side letters. Why? why what's the politics? Why hasn't it worked better? I think... Yep. You're good. I think that I think the reason I think the reason why is because the analysis people have had of some of the past trade agreements where ostensibly that kind of a trade off could have been made is that the actual terms of the agreements will have a big effect and that that effect will be so overwhelmingly negative that you actually can't compensate your way out of the problem. And this you know what, one of one of the fundamental I would say arguments, and the reason I, I said, you know, the sort of the list of arguments are like the whole set of tropes, is there there is at this point a lot of evidence that the current set of trade rules, not even about trade, not about tariffs. I mean, that was sort of done away with largely in the WTO. There's some peaks, but the incentives about investment, about you know what what basically Dean Baker calls selective free trade all of the regulatory decisions that have to do with how you're going to allocate capital and who are the winners and losers that are baked into these agreements, that all of those, um, all of those decisions basically end up having a lot of 
the progressives who would care about income inequality and trying to make that bargain say, we can't make that sort of agreement because the outcomes that we're going to have locked in, because trade agreements say, unlike the farm bill, which gets renegotiated every five years, they're stuck until you either decide to get out of them, never happens, or you so decide to renegotiate them, rarely happens. And so I think a lot of the people who might have the instincts to want to help the class of people who those kind of, they say, well, you can't compensate your way out of something that if the net outcome is more losers. And I think the thing that a lot, that turned that debate, honestly, and this gets to the sort of tropes issue, is in 2004, when Professor Paul Samuelson printed, published that article where he put the data, the current data into his own core formulas that we all learned in economics, more liberalization always leads to net welfare gains. Some people lose the imported competition sectors, but us consumers win when they're more cheap imports. We have net gains. And he did, he crunched the data. I mean, I could not read the math. I'd be interested in hearing, you know, the, the economist Kim's version of what she thinks about the math. But, you know, there were about three pages of advanced calculus that pointed out that as we're outsourcing more high wage jobs, including through some of the incentives in these trade agreements, in the service sector and investment, that the wage losses to a higher class of the income spectrum are now outweighing the consumer benefits of cheaper goods. And he proved it mathematically. Now, he didn't say, as a result, we should have protectionism. But he said, it is no longer the case that under the current rules, we're getting the net gains, which is one of the basic premises of, you know, like, I think, David, the slight modification of what you said, I don't think the US is winning under these trading globalization rules. You know, trade and globalization is like a generic. It's like the weather. But what is the weather? What are the terms of trade and globalization? Mm -hmm. So under these rules, I actually don't think I see. most workers, and it's not just U.S. versus foreigners, most working people. I mean, interestingly, Kim points this out, growing income inequality in rich and poor countries alike. And you, you have to think a little bit about under what global economic rules is this happening? Because this kind of gets to the enforcement issue. Right now, we have enforceable global rules that, that protect intellectual property, that limit financial regulation, that limit distinctions in energy between heavily climate disastrous and climate friendly kinds of energy. Those are enforceable. And in fact, even beyond the really important conundrum of the sovereignty versus leveraging market access, you know, in the trade agreements, you're required in your domestic laws to create criminal sanctions for IP violations at the standard in the agreements. So it's not just the tribunals. Actually, you're out of violation if you don't make criminal penalties under NAFTA for knocking off patents and copyrights. At the same time, there aren't any enforceable labor enforcement rules, which you know sort of gets to the other Kim's point, which is, just for the record, I thought we should get, at the time of the Seattle protests, my demand was, let's get the trade agreements back to trade, back to GATT, and get rid of all the other baggage that got pasted on. Unfortunately, we kind of lost that fight. So you have criminal penalties in trade agreements for IP violations. So then the question is, what are the glo what's the global floor? Right. And that gets to the very point the other Kim pointed out, which is some of these issues are not going to be dealt with unless there is some sort of transnational rules, tax avoidance, climate. And so I'm not calling for setting one-size-fits-all rules in the trade agreements. I think there are a whole set of democracy problems about that. But what I am saying is if you have a global economy and you have no global floor on which the competition happens, no global set of rules to avoid tax cheating across borders in all the clever ways, so, for instance, one of the ideas that Kim has about having sort of global accounting and global ways of finding where the taxes are and allocating them, super interesting, but you'd have to do that in some enforceable agreement where there's a hammer for if you don't comply. Kim, can you talk a little bit about, I promised the other panelists I wouldn't make them talk about taxes, so, but I know that won't uh, phase you. Um, to what extent, so Lori signs a lot of um, uh, the problems we have to the the rules of the global trading regime. But in your book, you suggest, this is maybe oversimplifying, so correct me if I'm wrong, that we ought to worry a lot more about how US tax law encourages companies to move stuff overseas uh, 
and that that's actually a bigger factor in what's alarming people than the trade agreements. Am I, have I got that 50-50 right, 50 percent right? Yeah, I think that's close enough that we can work with it. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> um, I guess my argument with respect to tax is that part of what we're seeing in a lot of countries, not just the United States, is this declining labor share of income and an increasing capital share of income. And um, you might wonder, well, who's, you know, holding that capital share of income? And often the capital sort of originates in corporate form and eventually is, is held by shareholders. And so that creates a really sort of important um, feature of the policy debate, which is how do we tax that capital income, since capital is an increasing share of all world income, and that's an important part of our uh, tax base, we might think about how we could creatively do that. Um, the U.S. tax code, both before and after the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that was um, passed um, and went into effect in 2018, but both before and after, it really encourages um, companies to shift profit to low tax locations. And before this tax law, it was because of deferral. You didn't have to pay tax on the foreign income until it was brought back to the United States. And that meant you could leave it indefinitely offshore, earning very low rates. Um, but after this um, act, we also have uh, an explicit sort of preference for foreign income, where it's only taxed to the extent that um, it's taxed abroad at a, at a rate that is, is below some global minimum. And so it's set at half the U.S. rate, effectively. So you can earn income abroad and pay a tax that's half that that you would in the United States. And so I, I think both of these are sort of a, an explicit sort of acknowledgement to the multinational community that's okay with us if you earn the income in lower tax locations and, in fact, avoid taxes on it. And you might say, well, that's okay that we're not collecting tax at the corporate level because we collect it at the individual level. Um, yet a paper that I wrote with uh, Len Berman, who's responsible for most of the work on that paper, um, shows that about 70% of all U.S. equity income goes completely untaxed at the individual level. So if you think about how we're dealing with this greater role of capital in the world economy is we're not <laughs> taxing most of it at the individual level and we're letting a lot of the tax at the business level um, escape you know, taxation altogether. And so this has cost, you know, the U.S. Treasury, I would argue, over $100 billion a year. Um, but foreign treasuries as well have faced substantial um, costs from this, this shifting. And this is a problem that we could probably address and make our tax system more equitable, and that would leave extra money for things like wage insurance and, and the earned income tax credit and, and direct solutions to the, the plight of American workers. Thank you. So as Kim Elliott pointed out, there's some elements of the conversation we're having here today that we could have had in uh, 1997 um, or 87. However, the, the big change in that time is the role of China. And I think it's a fair... Uh, generalization that there are a lot of people in town in Washington and in, in broadly who are like completely baffled by the president's fixation on steel and aluminum uh, are not convinced that making it harder for BMW to make cars in South Carolina and export them to China is a good idea or want to spend a lot of time changing the name of NAFTA to uh, uh, whatever it is MICA how, how do you how do you say it I know, but what's the oh, umka. umka? All right, <laughs> all right, all right. You know, yeah. I was trying to figure out what what were the acronym for NAFTA that would T R U M P would go for. I mean, that's okay. <laughs> we have a little contest later. But anyways, so uh, Kim Elliott and Samaya. I, so, but there are a lot of people who say, look, um, previous administrations thought they could bring China along. We brought them into the WTO. They were supposed to get more and more like us. Turns out um, some of them didn't get the memo, uh, or at least the ones, the ones who, got, who, who were sent that signal are no longer in power in China. I think that's probably a fair. So to what extent do you think the China, its growth in the world economy and the way it plays uh, economic strategy, both domestic and international, is, is really a, a change? And how do you think we should deal with it if you don't like Trump? Approach. Kim, do you want to start? And then Samaya, you can be thinking while she's talking. Huh? <laughs> so I'm going, to, I'm going to say something now that's probably going to, everybody on the panel can disagree with, which is to 
question this idea of trade agreements and trade sanctions as carrots and sticks. And I think, um, I think Samay is right that one, a big reason that trade agreements expanded so much was because of this idea that they have teeth. I think that what we found out is, in fact, those teeth are not all that sharp. There's just sanctions. I, that's the other part of my career has been working on economic sanctions since the early 1980s. Um, and they're just not as useful as people tend to think they are. Um, you know, Lori asserted that labor standards and trade agreements are not enforceable. That's not true. They are enforceable. They're just not enforced. And there are lots of reasons for that. But Part of it is that I think the sanctions, as the agreements are written, and this goes to the China, I'll come back to China, is, is why the, the Trump approach is not very useful. Sanctions, when they do work, you need something that you can, in terms of compliance, that is observable and measurable. Otherwise, your threat to sanction is not going to be credible because nobody knows exactly when it's going to happen. And that's been the problem with intellectual property. Intellectual property on paper, it's, it's not that different from the labor standards, actually, at least in the WTO context, um, right? It, the, the rules are there. They're enforceable. There have been very few, if any, cases brought at the WTO challenging developing country enforcement of intellectual property rules. Why? Well, one of them is, it's in fact, the WTO, contrary to what a lot of people think on intellectual property, it's, it gives a lot of flexibility to developing countries. And, 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 and again, and it's very fuzzy. What's a violation? Well, we're really not sure. So countries are afraid they're going to lose if they bring a case to the WTO, so they just haven't done it, which means they can't impose the sanctions. Um, in the China case, I think this is the, the, the problem that we're all grappling with is, you know, what does it mean for China to not do forced technology transfer? How do you define that? How do you measure it? How do you observe it if it's kind of a lot of it's under the table and not really spoken and companies don't want to talk about it? It's, and that's sort of, it looks to me like from the reports coming out of the meeting this week, that's where things are getting hung up is on Lighthizer demanding an enforcement mechanism. And I think that's why Trump gets fixated on trade deficits, because it's something observable and measurable. The problem is it's irrelevant um, to unfairness or to al almost anything else. And so details. I, yeah, details. So I think, um, but I also agree with what Sumeya also said about how, you know, the problem with um, the WTO has been that it does constrain the use of trade sanctions. You can't use them unilaterally anymore in trade disputes. At the same time that the WTO rules don't cover some of the Chinese practices very well or at all. And so that is a dilemma. And I think, you know, it's sort of a, a return to the 1980s aggressive unilateralism, except that we now do have a WTO. And so I think there is a dilemma for uh, those of us who um, you know, want to see freer and fairer trade in terms of how you deal with China if you can't use at least the threat of sanctions, but you also don't want to trash the WTO. And so it is a, it's, it's a, it poses some real dilemmas, I think. Samaya, your thoughts on that? Okay. Um, okay, so first of all, um, to make the semi-obvious point, um, which is that the China shock happened, um, it, and to, to an extent it's, it's kind of done, um, <laughs> And uh, that said, obviously, lots of the um, Trump administration concerns are that another shock could happen in future because of the policies that the Chinese government um, is undertaking. Um, so the, the, two, the two complaints that, that um, many people seem to agree on, uh, one is that, um, that, the, that there are, it's an unfair use of subsidies, right? Um, and... <coughs> you need to constrain that, and to an extent that's about how the Chinese economic system works. And um, aside from all of the, um, you, you know, the, the tough bilateral talks, there are people out there, you know, the EU, Japan, and the US, they are writing rules, they're writing new rules for how they might like to see this China subsidies issue dealt with. So my, my first point, I mean, there are... Um, more boring but potentially more constructive conversations going on outside of the kind of spotlight of, of US-China discussions in terms of how we might want to write better rules. You know, obviously at the end of that, all you have is tariffs to enforce any rules on subsidies. Um, so you kind of, you have a, a bit of a problem, particularly if the problem is that what's happening is that 
there are lots of subsidies going to industries, and what that's doing is it's depressing the global price of something, but it's not necessarily showing up in exports. Right? So traditionally, trade remedies have worked by um, putting tariffs on a specific, you know, there's unfair subsidies or, or dumping, selling below cost, and you put retaliatory tariffs on the exports of those goods, right? But if, but sometimes the problem of subsidies doesn't show up in excessive exports, it just shows up in, there's way too much production or capacity in China, and then you can't grab at anything to retaliate against, right? So that's kind of an issue that's coming up. The other issue is IP theft, um, and here, uh, so I did a Trade Talks episode on this um, a little while back and got an upset um, email from one of our listeners saying, why, why shouldn't China have the IP that it wants to, to get richer? <laughs> um, uh, and, you know, I find, I find it difficult to, to sort of grapple with that, right? Um, to an extent, like, I, you know, people in China on average are much poorer than they are in the US. Uh, I want them to get richer. <laughs> um, uh, I wish, going back to my point way, way, um, uh, before, I wish more of the the debate was wasn't about us versus them in terms of workers, right? I wish the debate wasn't about American workers competing with foreign workers and the foreign workers taking the jobs that have been offshored. Um, and and the, the focus on rules helps with that because it makes it clear that it's the rules under which those foreign workers are working. Um, so I think that's a that's a problem, the IP theft. Um, but it also, I suppose speaks to a question that you were asking before, which is the political economy of all of this. I think the reality is that the way trade agreements have been passed in the US is that you, you, you know, Congress, Congress approves the deal, it's an up or down, um, and the pharma lobby is uh, better at delivering votes than the people who want different things to be in trade deals. Um, so, uh, or at least that's been the historical experience. Um, and so when the negotiators are negotiating, that's one of the, you know, th that's the reality of how the process works. Now, clearly there being lots of pharma lobbyists as advisors is also, you know, doing something, perhaps if it was more weighted in terms of um, worker uh, representatives and that would help but that's kind of how things are done and that influences a lot of things including the kinds of complaints that are taken to the Chinese. Um, if there was a solution to the China dilemma in those last two answers I missed it but uh, uh, real short because I want to get some questions. I just want to point out something that Todd Tucker from the Roosevelt Institute taught me a long time ago in the data, which I think is very interesting, which is the poverty reduction that Kim, the author, pointed out uh, for China is largely because China didn't follow the rules. And this gets to Samaya's point about IP. So China signed up to the WTO, but then China pretty systematically either took actions in the big gaps of where WTO doesn't cover certain discipline certain behavior, or in other areas just broke the rules and wanted to rely on the difficulties in enforcement and how long it takes to enforce and who would dare sanction China because they'd retaliate against US investors, et cetera. And so I, did, I want to point out that the poverty reduction elements, the countries that have done the best, to some degree haven't signed up to the whole neoliberal smorgasbord versus if you look at some of the countries that did most faithfully, like Mexico, their growth rate and their poverty reduction has been anemic since they basically switched into, I'm buying this whole package whole hog. So th this also gets to what the policy outcomes and the rules are and what is and isn't affected by the rules. And I just wanted to flag that for the China debate because I think there is a whole set of issues about how people in China continue to get richer given poverty there is very, very grinding versus how we also have rules that help lift people up wage-wise and help with inequality in developing and developed countries simultaneously. Um, there's a lot there to chew on, and I'm not going to respond to. I am. I was waiting for you, Samaya, to mention that uh, we probably stole a lot of IP from the British textile makers early in our history, and, and that you might want it back. <laughs> That's fine. Um, I've forgiven you. We have time for a few questions. I'm going to suggest that we take two or three, and then... We'll let some, but not all, of the panelists answer every question. Uh, time is limited, so 
stand up, tell us who you are, and ask a question. Don't make a speech. You can save that for later. There's a gentleman in the back there. How in? <clears throat> yeah, I'm Bill Ellis from Georgia Mason. Yeah, I, I, I was curious about the uh, carbon costs of uh, outsourcing manufacturing to uh, distant con continents. I'm thinking about the uh, merchant marine and air fleets transporting raw materials like energy and ore and uh, finished products and uh, recyclables and so forth back and forth between continents when that stuff can be manufactured here. <clears throat> Excuse me, here. Uh, there must be some cost. I think I read in the Wall Street Journal that something like 50,000 merchant ships burning 4 million barrels of oil, <coughs> oil a day. Sorry. <clears throat> Um, there's a gentleman here, Howen, and there's a gentleman right here. Okay. Irving Williamson, U.S. International Trade Commission. Uh, I was just wanted to comment, pile out, pile out a comment on I th the overwhelming importance of dealing with the tax policy, competition policy. We didn't talk about infrastructure. We didn't talk, well, there's some mention of education. But all of those things that are going to make the U.S. economy and U.S. workers domestically more, you know, make them more competitive versus the, the whole debate about trade agreements and what they do. And I've been working on trade policy for 40 years, but I do think it's that domestic policy changes. Or even labor, enforcing US, labor laws that we have in trade agreements in the U.S. So Thank you. there's I, a whole lot there. That, right, I think that, and that's very much in the spirit of Kim's book. Hello, I'm Charles Cartier. I'm um, chairman of the Economic Development Board of Mauritius. As you might not know, uh, Mauritius is one of the countries that has implemented the negative income tax. Um, my question is linked to uh, something which I think uh, all the presenters uh, try to agree, is that uh, a lot of the problem that we are facing is due to automation. Uh, that is, um, there is growth, but automation is bringing all the fruits of that growth uh, to uh, capital owners. Uh, if we look at that long term, if that trend continues, uh, won't we be in a situation where, in fact, workers will not be needed and that we will be faced with uh, only one question, how do we share the fruit of growth to the uh, mass? Thank you. Okay. Uh, so Kim, I think Maybe you can start on those. One is about a narrow question on the carbon cost of transporting goods. Would we have... How would a carbon tax affect that, if you know? Um, yeah, I mean, I, the proposal that recently was endorsed by a lot of economists suggested that the U.S. adopt a carbon tax and then have an adjustment sort of at the borders such that if other countries weren't pricing carbon that we would take that into account with our trade policy. I mean, I think that's one way of handling that issue. Uh, but I guess I would be wary of indirect solutions to this, just like I am with uh, indirect solutions to the broader income inequality question. It's not trade per se or GDP per se that is bad for carbon footprints. It's carbon that's <laughs> bad for carbon footprints, right? So you could restrict trade or you could cap GDP, someone suggested to me. Uh, which I think both of those are kind of silly ways to get at the carbon problem. When you know that it's carbon that's creating the carbon problem, then the way to get to that is to go to the carbon tax. And I, and I think that that's a theme that actually relates to these other issues, too. I mean, if you think about uh, workers, in a way, it doesn't matter whether it's trade or automation that's hurting the workers. Something is, right? And so we could bicker all day about whether it's trade or automation. And I think my reading of the literature is somewhat different from uh, Lori's, but Regardless of what it is, the question is, is restricting one of those things good for workers, or are there more direct ways to help them? And the argument in the book is that there are far more direct ways and to help them. And on the list of 10 things to worry about, mm -hmm. where does we're going to run out of work fall on the day that we created 300,000 more jobs? Yeah, I worry a lot less about that than many people do, in part because um, look at our unemployment rate. As you point out, it's, it's very low. I think the problem isn't so much that we don't have jobs, it's that the jobs don't pay well. And the answer to that is is redistribution. Um, so I'm not a huge fan of, for instance, the universal basic income. But what I would like to see is that we make work pay better through things like negative income taxes and the um, earned income tax credit. And then if we end up with jobs in our economy that don't pay as well as they should, we, we raise that bottom through those powerful tax policy tools um, rather than paying people not to work, which I think is a step in, in the wrong direction. Okay, can we take a few more? Um, 
uh, how much you stop there and then go to the back. Yeah. Sure, Nico Luciani at Oxfam, thanks for this great book. If anything, it helps uh, trade people think about tax and migration people think about tax and trade. I think it brings these things together, which is excellent. My question was about the investor state dispute settlement mechanism, as I mentioned a couple times. Mm-hmm. I wonder if you could elaborate how that impinges on autonomy, sovereignty on issues like public health or climate change, or um, also just costing a lot of money for some developing countries that are facing these lawsuits. Thanks. I think there was someone in the back. Uh, David Wentworth, consultant to the bank and the fund. Um, I'd like to address the question that was raised uh, about politics. Um, How can your policies be presented as something that appears to the average voter as change as opposed to not change? I think he heard you, Laurie. (laughs) Um, All right. Does someone want to take the investor states issue, Uh, the, the dispute resolution? Kim? I mean, I think my take on it is ISDS is on its way out. It's, there's just, there has been a huge backlash, I think legitimately so. The USMCA, I think Lori addressed that, you know, is, has already pared back ISDS quite a bit. I mean, it's going to eliminate it between the U.S. and Canada if it goes through. Um, so I think it has been a problem. I think the backlash in that case is working and it's going away. Um, and I just, if I could go back on the previous question about automation and jobs, Kim has focused a lot on tax policy and sort of direct redistribution via, via the tax system. I think we also ought to be talking about better jobs. A lot of these jobs, and although this is where immigration comes in, they're non-tradable, maybe they're subject to competition via immigration. Again, I would tend to agree that trying to limit those things I don't think is the right way to go, but we can make those better jobs through, through you know, trying to strengthen unions, in some cases through regulation, um, in some, it comes back to tax policy in different ways, just taxing more so that we can pay our teachers more. I was shocked by this Washington Post article, I think yesterday, about how most teachers now are below the median wage. I, so I think I don't want to focus just on the taxes, though. I, you know, just how do we make these better jobs? And that still involves redistribution, potentially, from consumers to workers, because maybe prices go up a little bit. But I think that needs a lot more focus than we're giving it. Laurie, on dispute resolution? Um, On ISDS, but also just on the carbon issue, there's a really interesting study that the Sierra Club put together about what what would be the trade implications if you basically forced companies to internalize what is now basically, they call it environmental dumping, externalizing those carbon costs, and whether or not that would create different incentives for what is economically basically profitable as far as distribution of production. And it's an interesting, it's a sort of interesting jobs and investment redistribution argument as well as a climate plant survivability one because some of the construct of very centralized long distance shipping in an era of climate chaos may or may not be sustainable. There's also just, for the person who asked that question, a UN study, which I can't remember the number, but they actually figured out the percentage of carbon contribution to long distance shipping. On the ISDS issue, um, I would say to Kim Elliott, from her mouth to God's ears, that it's going away. However, (laughs) however, I just want to flag, there is a tremendous pushback. So there's a lot of data. Go to tradewatch.org. We've collected all the statements from different developing countries, from jurists around the world about the problems. It's very well, it's very well documented. But both with respect, bizarrely, with the European Union's Multilateral Investment Court, which is sort of ISDS with some new trim and paint that's trying to revive it under a different brand. And also right now, UNCITRAL, one of the main ISDS venues, is having this unbelievable kabuki dance festival of trying to pretend they're talking about the problems when in fact they're trying to sort of restore the legitimacy of ISDS. So there's a very powerful lobby of multinational corporations, the oil and gas guys, the pharmaceutical companies, et cetera, who use ISDS, who do not want it to go away. So that is not one where I would say Oxfam or anyone else should necessarily feel relieved yet. Briefly? Can I, yeah, so on ISDS, um, I think, yeah, it's changing. uh, It's definitely the case that um, there are people in the current Trump administration who really hate it, hate the idea of a foreign investor being able to sue the US. 
there's, there's, th I guess there's, there's two. Rather than banning it, you, you could change it. So the Europeans have this investor court and try and make it better. Um, one of the problems with ISDS is that um, you can have lots of bites at the apple. So there isn't, you know, it, the, the kind of these ad hoc, um, uh, you know, committees. And 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 so if there was a court, perhaps you could institutionalize it, make it a bit friendlier. Um, there's another way of looking at the argument, which is um, Sometimes I've heard it's unfair that investors get to sue foreign governments and workers don't, right? And so there's this kind of you could twist it round and say, well, if you know, if there was you know labor state dispute settlement, would we be happier? <laughs> um, you know, given that perhaps this thing is going to prove fairly tricky to eliminate, um, and that's a discussion that I don't I don't see happening um, enough. I think. Okay, thanks. Um, we're almost out of time, so I want to ask just one final question. See if you guys can. Um, answer this if, in, sh briefly. So if there was a presidential candidate in the audience who said, I care about the world, I care about workers, what is one thing in this globalization sphere you think I should know and do something about? Just of all the things, what's the one thing that should be on my to-do list? Lori, do you want to start? See if Lori can do one sentence. I'm going to pass and come back. To okay, that. Samaya? <laughs> If I have to do one sentence, that's hard. <laughs> people don't care that much about trade. Uh, people, people, I mean, there was a chart, in your, but like, peop, so attitudes among Republicans to trade have improved remarkably uh, now that President Donald Trump uh, is in office. Uh, trade isn't really a priority for people. What is? Like healthcare, <laughs> the important stuff, right? The the wages, you know, the, the other stuff, right? Uh, you know, I'm a I I cover the U.S. economy and trade. I spent the last few years gathering an immense amount of expertise on random bits of trade law. Uh, I think I think that's not good for the country. <laughs> um, Must be great at cocktail parties, though. It's great. People love it. Um, uh, okay, you yeah. had your sense, Kim. <laughs> I, I think it, uh, two. Can I have two? One yes. is because fix the domestic agenda, but two, um, empower workers, but don't expect trade agreements to do it. Are you ready yet or not? I think the answer is that we need to basically replace a bunch of our current rules so that we are sending different incentives in the global economy vis a vis both investment patterns but also patterns of behavior relating to climate taxation, but also relating to labor rights, relating to environment, both transnational and domestic environmental issues, so that we have a set of global rules for the global economy that prioritizes people on the planet in contrast to the current structure, which prioritizes multinational companies, capital, however you want to describe who's captured the process. Um, I think for in terms of the global thing, my first point would be to say that immigration is a tremendous strength for the U.S. economy and it would be better to have more rather than less immigrants. Um, I would also add, if I got to, that I don't think trade barriers are at all a useful solution for American workers and that focusing on fundamentals actually is a really big change relative to what a lot of people have do, been doing. Big investments in infrastructure, R&D and education are things that people would really be excited about as is a much more equitable tax system would also be a huge change that I think you could sell easily. So I would focus on the domestic actually in an election, but I wouldn't see a, a need to raise trade barriers and I would keep as many immigrants as possible. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. I'm sorry to get more questions. A favor, if there's papers or coffee cups at your seat, it would help our people if you took them to the back and put them in the recycling. And with that, please join me in thanking Kim and the rest of the panel. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.